All right, good morning again for those of you who already heard me the first time. And good morning afresh to y'all who just joined us. I've got the do now up as usual, but I'm going to go over it now because it's almost 8.04. So you had to complete the unit equation. I had two problems here. The first one, you have to fill in the prefix. So you would find 0 0.1 on the chart. There's 0 0.1. And that's for deci. So you fill in a D there. To figure out one centisecond, you find the C. And you fill in one of those two numbers, either 0 0.01 or 1 times 10 to the minus 2. I always, I usually favor the scientific notation. Makes more sense to my brain. But either one would be fine. So if you didn't have a chance to do that, that's cool. If you did, then let me know if you got it right. Cool. All right. So that was a little warm up. Now let's do a real problem. Okay. So I'll give you about five minutes. We'll kind of, I'll talk it through with you and then I'll give you five minutes to solve it. So you're waiting in line at Chick fil A. There's eight people in front of you. The total distance between you and the pleasant employee ready to take your order is 54 feet. How many centimeters are between you and delicious destiny? I like Chick-fil-A, if you couldn't tell. Haven't had it in like at least a year because we ain't doing no takeout in the vid. Anyway, you have to take 54 feet. So this is your question. Fifty four feet is equal to how many centimeters? I already told you how many meters, all right? So one meter is equal to three point two eight feet. That's going to be your first unit equation. For your second unit equation, you have to figure out meters and centimeters, how those are related, and then set up your equation. So I'll give you five minutes, and then I'll check back in and solve the problem. Okay, so if you got an answer, you can share it if you want. If you're still working, keep working. I'm going to start solving. I already set you up with your first two unit equations. The first unit equation was given in the problem. One meter is equal to 3.28 feet. We've got to write those unit factors. Is anybody else having an issue with their screen being black? Because it says that I'm still sharing.
Okay. So if you're having an issue, then maybe you need to leave out and then come back. Those are our unit factors for the first unit equation. The second unit equation has to do with meters and centimeters. If I've got one centimeter, then I have one times 10 to the minus second meters. And that was one of the, we did a centi conversion um, for the do now. So hopefully that helped you out. There's our two unit equations and our two sets of unit factors. To set up the equation, we're starting with our 54 feet. In the first part, we're going from feet to meters. Feet have to be in the bottom, so we choose this unit factor. Feet have to be in the bottom so that we can cancel out feet. Now we're going from meters to centimeters which means I need to cancel out meters. I've got meters in the numerator. I have to have meters in my denominator in my unit factor. Let's check and make sure that the units cancel. That's good. That's good. Now you do the math. 54 divided by 3.28 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 2. And your calculator will tell you 0.5 this number. So we need to look to the problem for sig figs. 54 feet, 54.0, that's three sig figs. So if we round to three sig figs, that means we're gonna round the four. We look at the six to see if we round up or stay the same. Six is definitely five or greater. one, six, five, then we add that placeholder zero and add our units. You could also have written it in scientific notation if you so desired. So how do we do on that one? I know a couple of y'all shared your answer, but how do we do? If it was eh, keep working and practice. I will post chapter two practice problems today. And if you have questions, you can always let me know. And if you just want to go over a couple of problems or do a problem or two, you can stop by office hours, which are today from 11 to 1. 
So let's move on. We're going to finish up chapter two. Still talking about the metric system. We're going to cover volume, density, temperature, and specific heat. So another several topics. Still more math, so don't put your calculator away. First, we'll talk about volume. Now, real quick, just to make sure everybody's caught up. Volume is length times width times height. You may also see length times width times thickness. Same thing. That's how you calculate volume. Because of this, you're going to have some kind of unit squared. So it's going to be, or excuse me, cubed. Meters cubed or centimeters cubed. Some kind of length measurement cubed. Here we've got the volume of a Rubik's Cube with, I don't even know, they probably still make Rubik's Cubes. This is definitely a big 80s thing. So, just bear with me. If the volume of a Rubik's Cube is 185.2 centimeters cubed, what is the volume of the cube in meters cubed? So this is a volume problem, but not in the sense that we need to solve it and figure out what the volume is by multiplying with length times width times height. We need to do a volume conversion. I showed one of these in the video, but I'm going to do another one just to make sure that we're all on the same page. This is my volume. And those units, what we're really saying is 185.2 centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. I have to replace each of those centimeters with meters. What we're going to have to do is figure out a unit equation. that relates meters and centimeters, which we already did that. So we know that one centimeter is equal to one times 10 to the minus two meters. That was just, we did that exact one last slide. In our unit factors, But here's where it becomes a little bit different. I'm writing it out this way on purpose to demonstrate the point. When you're doing the problem, you don't have to write it exactly like this with the centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, unless it helps you. We have to cancel out centimeters three times and replace it with meters. So we have to use our unit factor three times. So we're multiplying by the same unit factor three times. We want the unit factor that has centimeters on the bottom. So there's one. I hope nobody is red, green, color blind. I'm always worried when I use red and green. So does everybody see that? That we had to cancel out centimeters three times so we could get the proper unit of meters cubed.
Put that into your calculator and let me know what you get. Give it to me in scientific notation. Yeah, that's it. 1.85 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. So I want you guys to try a problem, unless someone wants me to go over that again. So let me know if you're ready to try your own problem. I don't know if Blackboard is delayed or if everybody's being quiet. Okay, there's a question. Would it be 1.852 because of sig figs? So, oh, I just left off the two. It should be 1.852. We didn't do any, um, we didn't use any numbers that would change the number of sig figs. So all the sig figs are coming from that volume of 185.2 centimeters cubed. So it's 10 to the fourth. So when you did the calculation on your calculator it should be it probably said that so we need to make a coefficient that is at least one greater and no greater than 10 it has to be less than 10 so we're gonna move that decimal point to between the 1 and the 8 And then the number of places you moved was four. And this number is much smaller than one. So it's negative. All right. Now I want you guys to try one. So we've got the same volume, 185.2 centimeters cubed. But this time, I want you to convert that volume to inches cubed. And I gave you the unit equation for that. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. I'll give you about three minutes to start working on it. And then I will jump in, write it out, and then we'll see what the answer is together. All right, if you would like to share your answer in the chat, Go right ahead. I'm going to start writing it out. If you still need more time, keep working. We've got our unit equation. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So all we have to do is write out the unit factors, which is the easiest part. I'm going to write out the units again just to demonstrate. Yeah, you don't have to write it in scientific notation. Um, I just always give that as an option.
which unit or which unit factor am I going to use, A or B? Yes, I'm going to use A. So there's crossing it out once. Twice. and three times. Now we are going to be in inches cubed. And you should have, your calculator is going to tell you 11.3016. We have four sig figs here. There's our answer. 11.30 inches cubed. Questions? Let me know if you're good. Alrighty. Good. So that's volume. That's all we're really doing with that. I went over some more details in the recorded video about um, talking about the liter and how it's related to centimeters cubed and milliliters. So that's just kind of a watch the video. Make sure that that makes sense to you. It should if you understand this concept here with volume. We're going to keep going with volume and how we can calculate volume. So sometimes you can't really measure length, width, and height or thickness. Sometimes you have a solid that is just an irregular shape, right? One way that you can measure volume is by using this method of volume by displacement. You have a graduated cylinder or some other kind of volumetric um, instrument that you put water or some other liquid but typically water in and you fill it to a known level so here we've got 30 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder you add in your sample and you'll notice that the level of the water rises so in this example now we've got 38 milliliters. To calculate our volume, you take the final volume of the water and you subtract the initial. So what is the volume of my green jade sample? That should be 38. So 
So if we're using the sig fig rules, it should be 8.0, and that gives us two sig figs, eight milliliters. Now, we don't normally use milliliters to describe volume of a solid, but one milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter. And again, I talk about that in the video. We don't really have time to cover that. So if you didn't get a chance to watch it, just take my word for it. So our volume for a solid, you want to report it with cubic centimeters. We good on volume by displacement? All right, make sure you tuck that in the back of your brain because we're gonna pull it out again in just a couple of slides. There's another volume by displacement method for gases. You can't exactly measure the volume of a gas, especially when you can't see it or anything like that, right? But what you can do is if you have your reaction in here and say it needs to be heated or something like that, it's over a Bunsen burner, you're generating your gas. You have this reaction set up to where the gas that you form goes through this tubing down into this flask. And the flask has water in it. As you make more gas, you're gonna apply pressure to that water and cause it to go up this capillary tube. and it displaces the water into whatever other vessel you have. Could be a beaker, graduated cylinder. Whatever it is. You can measure the amount of water that is displaced. And the amount of volume that you have in this container is going to be equal to the volume of gas. So for gas, we can use milliliters here. So if you measure, you know, 57.8 milliliters of water, then your volume of gas is 57.8 milliliters. Does everybody understand that? So we talked about volume, talked about ways to calculate volume. Now we're going to cover density. Density is the mass divided by volume. And it's a measure of how much stuff you can fit inside of a particular volume. So how much stuff can I fit inside of one centimeter cubed or one milliliter. The higher the density, the more mass you can fit in one particular volume. So we'll do a practice problem just to practice calculating density and then we'll kind of grow from there and get a little bit more complex, a little bit more complex. That's the plan. So we've got a metal solid that has a mass of 51.2 grams and a volume of 6.50 centimeters cubed 
what's the density of the metal? As long as you know the equation, which on an exam you'd have an equation sheet, all you have to do for this one is plug in the numbers. Tell me what you get on your calculator. So my calculator said 7.876 and some other numbers. How many sig figs do we need? Three. So we're looking at that seven. We're gonna round it up or keep it the same. Six is definitely five or greater. So that seven is gonna get rounded up. In our units, we have grams divided by centimeters cubed. That's the simplest density problem that you can get. You have a mass, you have a volume, take one, divide it by the other. I figured you didn't have that point too. I was like, that's close, but not quite. And on an exam, you'd get most of the credit. Cause that's just a little, that's a small error. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take off eight points out of a 10 point question because you didn't put the point to. You understand the concept. That's where I, I care more that you understand how to get the answer than the actual answer itself, all right? So that's density. Let's bump it up a little bit. Aluminum has a density of 2.70 grams per cubic meter. What is the volume of a piece of aluminum with a mass of 28.3 grams? A little bit more complicated here. So our question is, what is the volume? And we're dealing with something that is a solid so our unit should be centimeters cubed. The information we're given, we know that the density of aluminum is 2.70 grams per cubic meter. We also know that the mass of the solid is 28.3 grams. And if you feel comfortable trying to solve this and go ahead of me, you're more than welcome to. If you're not, stick with me, we'll do it together. So these are the two things that we're given. But there's something else that we know that we can add to this. That density that we're given, the 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter, that is equal to 
the mass divided by the volume. If we have the mass, which we do, then we have enough information to solve for the volume. So what we're going to do is take density. We're just going to take that equation with no numbers. And rearrange it so that we can solve for volume. So there are two ways that we can do this. I'm going to show you the way that I think is a little bit easier. If you multiply by volume on both sides, then you get that volume out of the denominator. Then you divide by density on both sides. So that you have volume is equal to mass divided by density. Then we just plug in the numbers. Our mass was 28.3 grams. The density we were given was 2.70 grams per cubic meter. Let me know what you get. Do that division. Your calculator is going to say 10.481, some other numbers. But we need three sig figs because our density and our mass both have three sig figs. already. So it's 10.5 centimeters cubed. Don't forget your units. I'll take off like half a point if you don't have units. It's not a lot, but it can add up. Go for it if you have a question. We don't know what the volume is. We're trying to figure that out. So what we're really doing is we're taking our mass and we're using the density as a unit factor.
That's what we're really doing. But sometimes that concept doesn't connect on the first go. So I show you how to solve the equation, which is something you're used to. And then we get the answer. And then I say, by the way, this is what we're really doing using density as a unit factor. So you kind of, you blew the surprise, but it's okay. So does that help make it a little, make it make sense? Okay. And then there's another question in the chat. Could that also be written as 10.5 milliliters? Oh, you're fine. So we're gonna say no for that one because our units for the density are grams per centimeter cubed. So you should write centimeters cubed. Also, it's a solid. I talk about it in the video, but for solids, you wanna use centimeters cubed for volume. For liquids and gases, you can use milliliters or liters. Let me write out the or because somebody's going to look at the notes and think that you have to do milliliters over liters. Okay. Yes, it does. But in terms of the notation, it's just customary to use centimeters cubed. So they're the same volumetrically, but in terms of what you see for solids versus liquids and gases, if you see centimeters cubed, think solids. It's not wrong, it's just the what you typically see in the field. Does that make sense? Okay, so we just did one. I have another one very similar to it. Are we ready to move on for you to try that one on your own? Here we go. You've got liquid mercury. It's got a pretty high density. It's 13.6 grams per milliliter. Now notice I said liquid mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature, which is kind of weird for a metal, but mercury is weird. What is the mass of a 61.0 milliliter sample? So it's very similar to what we just did, only this time instead of volume, we're looking for mass. I will give you about three minutes to get started and then I'll check in and I'll either start solving it or if you need more time, I'll give you maybe another minute or so. If you need help setting it up, then when I check in the first time, that'll be the time to say it. So go and give it a try and I'll check in in three minutes. All right, here's the check-in time. How are we doing? Need more time? Stuck? Ready to go over it? Let me know where you are. All right, let's go over it. This time, we're trying to figure out what the mass is. So that means we're gonna get some number in grams. How many significant figures should we have for our answer?
We should have three sig figs. So we got that out of the way. Here's what we're given. The density is 13.6 grams per milliliter. We've got a volume of 61 milliliters. We also know our equation. Now you could put the numbers in here and rearrange and solve for mass. You just multiply by the volume, right? And that's what you would get. When we set this up, though, that's our density, and that's a unit factor. So that's what we've been doing. It's not a surprise because I already said that before, but it's okay. You can use density as a unit factor and you can solve for the mass or the volume given that you have enough information. The milliliters cancel and you're left with grams. Your calculator is going to say, whoops, it's going to say nothing because I didn't write it. Okay, 829.6, and then we put in the units, right, milliliters. But that's not three sig figs, that's four. We're looking at the nine to round up or stay the same. 6 is greater, 5 or greater, so we need to round up. But we don't really have anywhere to go from the 9, right? So we've got to actually bump this up to 830. But that's only two sig figs. So here are our options. You add a decimal point, and that makes it three sig figs. Or... You use scientific notation, and I wrote milliliters instead of grams. Sorry, y'all. My brain. When you see something like that, please say something. Because sometimes mommy brain kicks in. So those are the two ways that you can represent three significant figures with that number. So let me know how you did. Did we get this number from our calculator and then get stuck? Did we not get this far? How did we do? Okay, so your units weren't right, but do you understand that what the units are now? Okay. So part of writing down the question is understanding what your units should be. And sometimes that can help guide you with putting your equation together. And you can always, I'm an instructor, I shouldn't be saying this, but you can kind of fudge it a little bit. You know you got the number right, and you're like, man, I don't know how these units cancel. 
but I know it's supposed to be this. I know it's supposed to be mass, so I'm going to slap grams on it. That will still get you the points. Just trying to help you all out. We ready to move on? We're still working with density here. So remember that whole volume by displacement thing? That's coming back. So density, we can use volume by displacement to figure out the volume of a sample. And then we can use that volume to calculate density or in a density problem. So here's the exact same image, right? And we know that we had our eight milliliters of displacement of water and that that eight milliliters means eight grams per centimeter cubed or eight grams centimeter cubed. Why can't I talk today? 8.0 centimeters cubed. Help me y'all say a prayer. <laughs> Tongue tied this morning. We can use this in a density problem. So if you see something like this where you are given the density and then a sample was placed in water and the water is displaced by X amount, that's your clue that you're looking at volume by displacement. In this problem, we have to figure out the mass of the sample. So the density of green jade is 3.33 grams per centimeter cubed. Water displacement of 8 milliliters, which is 8.0 centimeters cubed for our volume. What is the mass? Well, we just did that type of problem. So this is literally the same type of problem as we just did. But instead of being told directly what the volume is, you're told about water displacement. Does everybody see that? Go ahead and put that in your calculator and let me know what you get. Whenever you see numbers up there and we're solving a problem, just start putting it in your calculator. You know I'm going to ask. So the centimeters cubed cancel. You've got grams. Your calculator says 26.64. Our volume only has two sig figs. So we have to round here. Actually, let me use my red. So we can only have two sig figs in our answer. Twenty-seven grams. 
Now again, if you put 26.6 grams, you'll lose like half a point, maybe a point. And off of a five point or 10 point problem, not really that much. So pay attention to your sig figs. Everybody still with me? Were you on the same page? All right. Then I want you to try one on your own. You've got a metal sample. You've got the mass. Displacement of water. What is the density of the metal? I'll give you three minutes and then I'll get started. Alrighty, let's start solving. This time our question is, what's the density? So we should be looking for our units to be grams per centimeter cubed. We've got two sig figs in the mass and three sig figs in the displacement of water, which is going to be where our volume of the solid comes from. That means that our answer should have two sig figs. All of our given information. We've got a mass. And we've got a volume because the sample displaced 12.0 milliliters of water. We can write that as 12.0 centimeters cubed. The final piece is knowing what density equals. So this is bringing in our knowledge mass divided by volume will give us the density. Our mass is 5.2 grams. Our volume is 12.0 centimeters cubed. When you put that into your calculator, you should get something like that. We only need two sig figs. So there's our answer. How'd we do with that one? Did we get it? Excellent. So for those of you who aren't chiming out with the answers or saying, yeah, I got it. If you didn't get it, don't be afraid to let me know. If you just kind of like to sit back and absorb it all in, and then try practice problems later, that's fine too. Everybody learns differently. But just know that I'm here for everybody, not just the people who are participating in the chat, but everybody. So if you need anything, let me know. You can always send a private chat message too. So this is a good time for a break. We did a lot of work with density and volume. 
the last two topics we have are temperature conversions and specific heat. So we'll take a 10 minute break here. It's about to be 9.25. Oh. Stop it. Stop it, stop it. We'll break until 9.35. All right, everybody, it's 9.35. We're going to get back to it. We're going to start off with temperature conversions. Everyone's familiar with Fahrenheit and Celsius, most likely. Fahrenheit, if you cook anything, if you've even gotten a, you know, brownie mix from the grocery store and put that in the oven, you know Fahrenheit from the weather, you know Fahrenheit. You may know Celsius too, either from chemistry or from, you know, just kind of seeing it around. You may not know Kelvin though. Kelvin is an absolute temperature scale. So when you say zero Kelvin, it means zero. Yeah, if you heard of it, you probably heard of it in, this, in the chemistry, physics, that kind of world. That's not something that you would just hear about on TV. With Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius, we're talking about a system where you can have negative temperatures. Kelvin, no such thing. And what temperature measures is the average kinetic energy of a particle in a system. So if we're looking at, let's say that you like to drink tea in the morning you heat up some water and the temperature is maybe 105, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, let's say. You don't want to boil it. You know, when you steep your tea, you don't want to use boiling water. You want it to be hot, but not too crazy. That means that one particle in that system, the cup of warm water, has an average kinetic energy associated with it. And that average kinetic energy equates to whatever degrees Fahrenheit. So that's what that means. In the video, I talk about temperature versus heat. Make sure that you understand that concept because we won't necessarily have time to hit that concept here. When we do exam review for exam one, I'll make sure to have a question like that that we do together in the live lecture so that we kind of hit it that way. But I'm not going to specifically cover that material. All right. So temperature conversions, pretty simple. These are the three equations that you'll get on the equation sheet to go from degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius, and then Celsius to Kelvin. Note, you cannot go directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. You have to go from degrees Fahrenheit two degrees Celsius, and then Celsius to Kelvin. There's no direct conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Everybody good on that?
Oh, you said hold. My bad. Yeah, if you want to jot these down, you can. On the next page, I have two problems that I want you to do, and I have these equations miniaturized so you can do them. Let me know when you're ready. You're very welcome. Okay, so I want you to do two conversions. The first one is 588 Kelvin to degrees Fahrenheit. So you're trying to figure out how many degrees Fahrenheit that is. Then I want you to take 125 degrees Fahrenheit and work that to how many Kelvin you have. I'll give you five minutes to do this and then I'll check back in. Alrighty. Are we ready or do we need more time? Okay, then let's start. For the first one, we've got 588 Kelvin. First thing we need to do is get to degrees Celsius. To do that, you're going to subtract 273. Then we take that 315 degrees Celsius and convert it to degrees Fahrenheit. And when you do that math, you should get 567 degrees Fahrenheit. Number two, we're going in the opposite direction. So we first need to take that 125 degrees Fahrenheit and convert to Celsius. So you plug it into that equation. <laughs> when you do that, We'll just call it that. It's a repeating six. When you do the subtraction here, you're going to end up with three sig figs. And then you multiply by this factor 100 over 180. That's exact. So you're going to end up with three sig figs here. This is degrees Celsius. Then we go from Celsius to Kelvin by just adding.
with addition, we can only keep up to the ones place. So we'll just call it 325 Kelvin. For temperatures, if you're doing an exam for me, I will tell you round to the ones place or round to the tenths place or something like that because it can be a little tricky with doing all of these operations. But as long as you got ballpark this answer for right now, I just want to make sure that you know how to use all three of these equations. So how do we do? Okay, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. I figured since it's just kind of plug in the numbers that we can do a couple of problems and be straight on that. So let's keep it pushing. Last concept we're going to cover is specific heat. Specific heat, it measures the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The units that we use for that is joules, which joules is energy, per gram degree Celsius. If you end up taking Chem 104, or if you're in nutrition, then you may also see calorie per gram degree Celsius. Calories are also a unit of energy, but we're not gonna cover calories in this class. If you wanna calculate the specific heat of a substance, then these are the things that you need. You need to know how much heat you're putting in, you need to know what mass your substance is, and the change in temperature. Oftentimes, uh-oh, I just saw it. Yep, let me fix it. Blackboard, why are we having so much trouble today? So we were talking about specific heat. Left off with the units. The units of specific heat are joules per gram degree Celsius. Then we started talking about how we calculate it. We've got the heat that you put in divided by the mass of your substance times the change in temperature. You can't always measure this directly. So what you do is you can either use what's called a calorimeter where you've got your sample. Let's say this is your sample here. You've got some ignition coils. And that chamber that's in there is filled with oxygen. That chamber is inside another chamber that's filled with water. And there's usually a thermometer as well. And essentially what you do is you light your sample on fire. Not even playing games. This is how they calculate the amount of calories in your food. You burn it and you see how much energy is given off by burning that food. 
So all that heat is going to be absorbed by the water. So the little squiggles are my heat. The water absorbs it. And the amount of heat that the water absorbs is equal to the amount of heat that you put into the system. So what that means is that your heat absorbed is going to be the Q. So when you're doing these types of problems, it'll usually be something that has to do with, you know, water absorbing heat. If you're talking about a calorimeter, um, you can also do reactions that will require heat to be added in. Those are endothermic reactions. If the if you have that kind of a reaction, then the water will actually get colder. But either way, the what the water does, the change in temperature of the water can be related to the specific heat of the substance you're interested in. Now, you don't need to know how a calorimeter works. But I think that it helps to kind of wrap your mind around the idea of what it is that you're looking at. So we're going to take this information and look at a sample problem. I didn't ask if y'all were ready because you may have wanted to jot something down. Can I move on to the next slide to the practice problem? All right, so here's a practice problem. It's a paragraph of text, but we'll pull out the relevant information and do the problem together. So you're performing a reaction in a flask in a water bath. It's the same kind of setup as a calorimeter, only we're just doing it pretty simple. We've got a flask, we're doing some kind of a reaction in there, and the water is absorbing whatever the heat is. So I'll draw that out. There's my flask. It's going to be giving off heat. And it's hanging out in some water. So that's all that means. You've got a flask in a water bath. Whatever reaction is going on, the heat moves from that reaction flask to the water bath. The initial temperature of the water bath was 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Final temperature, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The mass of the water is 2,450 grams and the specific heat of water is 4.186 joules per gram degree Celsius. You have to calculate the amount of heat released into the water. So two things here. Number one, you cannot use degrees Fahrenheit in the specific heat equation. Your temperatures must be degrees Celsius or Kelvin because those slices are equivalent sizes. You can't use Fahrenheit. So 
So that delta T is just the change in temperature. You have to use degrees Celsius. So what I want you to do first is figure out what my initial temperature and my final temperature are in degrees Celsius. And I put the equation here for you. So figure that out and then you can put it in the chat. Realized I wasn't recording this part. So hopefully y'all will be all right if I go over it a little bit more in detail once again, once we get the actual answer. When you put all this into the calculator, you're going to get a big number. And that's okay. And I'll show you how the units work out. The grams get canceled. The degrees Celsius gets canceled. And you're left with joules. But we still need to handle sig figs. Before we handle sig figs, does everybody understand how we got to this point? We figured out our temperatures in degrees Celsius. So the 2.8 turns to positive because what we originally had was 7.2 minus negative 2.8. When, when you're subtracting, if you're subtracting a negative number, that turns into adding. So we figured out that delta T. We rearranged our equation. We know how to find the Q, the heat. And we got this big number. But we can only have two sig figs because of our initial information in the problem. The temperature has two sig figs. To turn this into two sig figs, you have to use scientific notation. One, two, three, four, five. So you have to use scientific notation. There's no way to show that number with two sig figs without scientific notation. I don't focus too heavy on the specific heat on the exam, but you'll have some problems on your homework. And if you have to end up taking 106, 107, I'm sure you'll do more work with specific heat. So I don't want to completely leave it out, but I don't focus too hard on it. I wanted to give you a sample problem though. So does this make sense to you? I don't have another sample problem, but if you need help with the homework, you can let me know. All right, yeah, just tell me, tell me how we're doing in general. Yeah. And 
and don't be afraid to send me your homework questions. So with that, your Mastering Chemistry Chapter 2 assignments are due on Sunday. So if you need help, get help. If you're not prepared to come to office hours or if you have class, that's all right. You can send me a screenshot of the problem. You can send me a screenshot of your work. And we can work it out that way using course messages. Or you can send me a message and say, hey, can we set up some time outside of your office hours? Because I need some help. Your first exam is coming up. It will be available on Wednesday, February 17th through Friday, which is the 19th. It will use Respondus Lockdown, so make sure that you have that installed on your computer. I believe there are some updates, so I will post an announcement with a link if you need to do those updates. If you need help using Respondus, I can help you. I'll also post a starter, you know, the starter guide PDF in course content. So you can look at that and that'll help you out too. We'll do some exam review in class along with chapter three. Chapter three isn't a big deal. I'm gonna post the video for it before class. If you get to it, great. If you don't, I understand you have an exam to study for. I also post exam reviews. So in course content, there will be an exam review folder. And that's where you'll go for every exam review that we have. I also post the answer key. So it'll have a folder for the reviews. And it'll also have answer keys. We'll go over some of the questions in class. Obviously, we can't go through the whole thing, but I usually choose a few questions that students typically have problems with and make sure that y'all get it. And then we move on with the, you know, the material for the day. Any questions about exam one? It covers the prerequisite science skills and chapter two, which we just finished today. If there's no questions, that's all I've got for you today. So you're free to go.